almost wish there were so many people came to my lectures rather than this video. <laughs> there you go. Um, can I just check what sort of distribution we've got in here? Have we got uh, any first years in here? Great, you probably don't know me because I wasn't here to do your induction. My name's Stuart Reed, I'm the principal, so hello. Um, <laughs> any second year? Yeah, third year, fourth year. Uh, any research students? That's a joke. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just to know that in terms of final year, who may be coming back to look at careers. Um, the thing I'd like to say to you is welcome to everybody, uh, from whatever background you've come, and whether you're, whatever program you're studying on, you're very welcome here to sit this evening. And as I say, I, I've, I've been uh, acquainted with the Chief Veterinary Officers for 27 years now, something like that. She was only five at the time, obviously. Um, <laughs> But uh, our careers go back to, to Glasgow. Now, I've got another question for you. How many of you here are going to go into uh, first opinion practice? Yeah? How many people are going to go into small animal practice then? Yeah. Anybody going to go into food animal practice? Equine practice? <coughs> Research? OK. Well, I'll tell you what. You probably aren't going to do those things, because there are, uh, there are two people at the front of this uh, meeting today that are more surprised than anybody because Christy certainly didn't think she was going to be where she is today and I certainly didn't think where I was going to be today so be prepared to be surprised. As I say, Christine and I met in Glasgow, she was a student, I was a junior member of staff. Um, Christine graduated in 1992 and then went into large animal practice in Scotland so she's well used to the weather we're experiencing this evening. She then went to, in terms of Glasgow, went to the Arch Enemy, to Edinburgh to do an in India, yeah, I'm afraid it's true, uh, did an internship there, and then spent some time as a named veterinary surgeon uh, and worked with it in, in commercial companies, and she may say a few words about that. She then joined the State Veterinary Service, and that path led eventually to some time in Australia as one of the Chief Veterinary Officers for New South Wales. New South Wales. Um, and then returned here to be uh, the Chief Veterinary Officer of the United Kingdom. Uh, I'm so glad uh, that you're all here tonight. I'll do a little uh, thank you at the end, but in the meantime, can I hand over to Christine Middlewis. Thank you, Christine. Great. much about the you know, Brexit world, you, you never think when you're out here, it's a bit, that's a great world. But today's going to end up, and it's really lovely to uh, feel the energy in the room, and um, lots of people starting out in their career um, and thinking about where you might want to go, and um, I suppose my advice on that is just don't shut any doors, because we are so lucky in this job that we can do so many different things. And as Stuart said, I never ever thought I would um, end up as UK CEO. I never thought I would work in the state veterinary service, but we'll come back to that. Um, I wanted to start off setting about what does the UK CEO do all day? Um, I'm so I'm the UK CEO, that means I'm England Chief Veterinary Officer and I represent the whole of the UK internationally. A big part of my day is thinking about disease response. There is that core bit we put in. We have a big TB problem in England, particularly. We spend about £100 million a year, TB and cattle controlling it. Um, and we worry a lot, I worry a lot about the exotic notifiable diseases foot and mouth disease, African swine fever, HIPAC, um, avian influenza, and so on. Thinking about the prevent, prepare, respond, recover, and so on. So, a big part of the day is about that. Why do we do that? Well, we really do that because we want to trade. Trading, um, and the income that comes from that influences market prices, and when I mean market, I mean livestock market prices, influences farm gate prices and supports rural health, both rural economy, but actual people working rurally, their health. When you don't just trade, it's based on whole network that we're going to talk about, standards, it's based on engagement and influence. So a lot of my time is spent representing the UK internationally, predominantly in Europe, but also wider field. We can't do any of that, the disease response or the trade and the insurance and verification without vets. So I need to think about our capacity, capability, and really importantly for me just now, the development of vets, both within government and without. <coughs> but that's what we'll talk about, we we'll go through. Vets and the whole chain are important to um, our animal health and welfare and how we talk about it internationally. 
sure it's some verification of what our animal health standards are. Um, and it's fair to say, following the spending review since 2010, so that's the government cutbacks, um, investment in veterinary development, particularly within government, has not been a priority and we some because of that. And then with the um, EU exit um, opportunities and challenges that come with it, we're thinking quite a lot at the moment about future animal health and welfare and future farming. How do we maintain that health in the rural economy? How do we stand up to the international standards that we want to have? So my day is made up of thinking about those things, working with the devolved chief vets, so the Sheila in Scotland, Christiane in Wales, Robert in Northern Ireland, working a lot with industry, and then a lot of public representation. Um, my background, I come from a um, hill sheep and cattle farming background in the south of Scotland, so I used to do um, night lambing when I was studying for my exams, um, which gave me some sort of peace and quiet. Um, great background. I've also come from a background of women farmers, family farms, um, because there wasn't many sons born, so they've gone down through women generations, and so it's not a um, hurdle for me to think about being a woman in our profession or farming. I spent, as Stuart said, quite a long time as a farm animal practitioner, and um, I've done slaughterhouse work too, um, and some named vet work. So that's under the Animal Scientific Procedures Act. If you're going to undertake a procedure in an animal that's not a normal management practice, you have to do it under the ASCA licensing. That's owned by the Home Office, because not DEFRA, because we actually have some of our own research work going on. Um, and some of that involvement was with Dolly the Sheep and the spin-off company of Dolly the Sheep. Um, I experienced BSE as a practitioner. I was graduated at the tail end of the BSE epidemic and so I still saw some clinical BSE cases, which gives you an understanding from farm level of what those potential impacts of notifiable zoonotic diseases are. Put mouth to these, 2001, I had just set up a practice with a friend from scratch in East Lothian in Scotland um, when foot mouth disease happened. Um, I had worked in Cumbria practice previously, so the, um, the outbreak and coming from a farming background and, uh, uh, and from farming practice, I really wanted to be part of it. I went to Carlisle for three weeks and I came back six months later, but it is one of the most formative learning experiences of my career. When I was out in New South Wales, I was, um, we were having a foot mouth disease exercise. Um, Australia exports over 70% of its red meat production, so diseases like foot and mouth disease, particularly when they're so close to Asia, are a big threat and a big worry. And um, the media people that were there asked me, so what was your biggest learning in 2001, thinking I was going to say something really techy? And it wasn't, it was about communication. Um, whether it was with farmers who were stressed and upset, other vets, um, the officials, that's in the civil servants, um, all across the board, communication is so important. I joined government in 2008. I never thought I would be a vet in government. I joined because I had been um, working as veterinary director in a sheep genetics company, which was hugely <coughs> fascinating because it was seeing the veterinary industry from a slightly different perspective and people want to breed really high value sheep. Top price um, Texel, top price sheep so far this year is a Texel six month old grand lamb, so over 200,000 guineas. So, farmers in that situation, they want to be the next top price, have the next top price sheep, and they're prepared to invest in it. And so, when you went on the farm, they were absolutely delighted to have you there, as opposed to the kind of BSE foot and mouth situation where um, there was a whole lot of anxiety. Um, my back gave in. None of um, being a vet, when you're young, you don't think about it. You lift heavy dogs, you do cow seizures, you do all these things because you're fit and able and you don't think about it, and, and none of them are very good for your back. So I needed a job that would not set my back. It didn't have to be on call, and that I wanted to live in it. And a job in government came up in Scotland um, that mixed both the veterinary advice and management, um, and I was lucky enough to get it, and that began my government career. Prior to that, I really thought that government vets were people who Tick boxes and um, knew a lot about legislation um, and, and couldn't see how they were making a difference. I hope as we go through tonight, um, you will see as I um, now see completely different perspective. I have never used my vet brain so much to make such a difference, but I wouldn't have seen that from the outside. And so I hope during my time as CEO I can talk about that well, 
that, that people um, see the opportunities you can have in state veterinary medicine. You don't have to come in with a new graduate into it. Um, you can build a whole skill portfolio before that and it can still be an option later on. What do I get from it? Um, what I really enjoy, and I've enjoyed all through my career, is complex problem solving. Um, so, new and emerging diseases. Um, should government take action or not take action? How does a disease work? Um, TB, for example. Um, in, when I was doing the sheep world, um, what's the best time, you know, um, what's the best way to approach this flock to get the best insemination rate, and so on. I enjoy complex problem solving. I like making a difference. I really enjoy people, actually. Um, I, I, that's something I realised as I've gone through my career. Um, I probably graduated as being relatively introverted, and the thought of standing up and talking to all of you, to me, all of you tonight would horrified me. Um, but you learn to enjoy these things and you develop your skills. Um, and it is quite a unique experience. Um, so in the last Three months probably I've met Galileo, the most valuable horse in the world currently alive. I've met Michelle Barney and Suzanne, I've been to Asia. Um, I've experienced a whole load of things that you would just never ever think that you would have the opportunity to do. And I'm not an expert in anything. I have a lot of experts to help me and advise me. My job is to put their expertise together in the context that ministers and senior officials need to hear. So as UK Chief Veterinary Officer, I'm the lead for veterinary technical advice to ministers and officials. Um, I lead on disease control and you know, disease outbreaks, and I represent the whole animal health and welfare standards in terms of trade internationally. So what I need to know is how it links together. Um, and I work with experts at Purbright, at Weybridge, um, our people out on farms, linking in to get their knowledge to work out what is the best solution and then communicate that to ministers. It's actually not that much different than what you do when you consult a consultant. Somebody comes in with their dog and it's not well and they give you some presenting signs but it's not the full picture and you have to work with them to get that full picture and you have to do your clinical examination and you're doing your problem solving. What might it be? What's the most likely diagnosis? What's it not going to be? What further work do I need to do? to get to understand what my options for treatment are, how do I communicate those and so on. It's actually very similar, but it's thinking about the national herd or the national flock. You might say that ministers are the owner. I'm probably going to talk a lot about trade because that's primarily why government thinks about animal health. Um, not so much animal welfare, but animal health. Um, there are four main reasons that gov government intervenes in animal disease. Um, it's diseases that have impacts, um, that impact trade, that might impact public health, um, that might impact the economy or society, um, and impact animal welfare. And so I want you to think as we go through, think about those things in terms of, because we're thinking about um, the role for vets going forward and my perspective, both formally and CBO and personal perspective, about um, how in that space we make the UK a credible training partner, enhance productivity to support our rural economic health as we go through EU exit, and how we build a brand for the UK <coughs> and what the vet role of vets in that might be. We're going to cover the animal health system, understanding our risks um, and our disease status, focus quite a lot on the EU trade system and therefore the EU exit and the potential implications of that, um, and then think a bit about future farming. So trade is a good thing, but if you just move animals, and move products of animal origin, which is germplasm or meat or sausages or chicken pies and things, um, there is a potential for them to spread diseases. African swine fever, for example, survives being smoked, survives the meat being frozen, and cured, and so on. Um, so uncontrolled movement of potentially infected products is, is bad, but trade and that economic um, value from it is good. So therefore, we've developed what I call global animal health system that manages that tension between good trade and bad disease impacts. And there's three key components of the standards of it, which are set by the OIE, the World Animal Health Organization. 
um, it is made up of member countries, and there's 183, so a lot of the countries around the world that are going to trade are members of the uh, OIE. Um, it sets the standards in terms of both biological standards around testing, some very prescriptive um, requirements around that, because it's important that if I'm saying my animals are free from African swine fever, and you say your animals are free, that we use the same text or the same standards so that my freedom is the same as yours and we're not going to spread disease. Um, they have a biological committee which is voted, um, members are voted onto it, um, and they make those sorts of decisions and then they're set in, in the broader um, manual that sets the standards. They've focused always primarily on diseases, the moving into space of antimicrobial resistance, as it becomes a bigger global drive to control that, and they're moving into animal welfare. The OIE, however, has no regulatory basis. Um, any regulation is set by the World Trade Organization, um, which is slightly different basis. So regulation and legislation, the need to get people to comply with those standards so you can trade is set at domestic at national level, or if you're a member of a bigger um, trading organization, the EU is set at that level. So legislation and regulation, the bit I thought that was all that state vets did, and um, it is important in terms of having the compliance to standards, inevitably, um, and it's set at domestic level. And then we have the competent authority, which is really where um, my role and other vets come in. It's about the assurance and verification of our standards. So if we say we're free from a disease, and um, I, slightly independent to ministers or to our industry, say, yep, we've done the tests and this is our status, and I can assure and verify that we are free from these diseases, whether it's an animal that's moving, a consignment of chicken pies, um, or a whole ship full of different things. That assurance and verification is really important, and that's underpinned by our veterinary structures, both in government, and our people in laboratories and so on, and then people at farm level. If you're looking at an animal and thinking, might this be the start of foot and mouth disease or something? That is really, really important. And so we're all from farm to fork part of that picture. Reputation and trade is everything. So it's no longer good enough in this world just to say, yep, we've got high animal health and welfare standards. You have to be able to evidence that. And evidence both from the individual level, as I've talked about, to country level. And it's not just saying, yep, we're free and we've done some tests. They have to be based on good science. You have to be doing surveillance in your population um, at a level that's robust to prove that you're free you have to have the underpinning legislation. Publishing and communicating what you're doing, um, I think, is a big important part of building trust and transparency to trade. And we in the UK do that quite a lot, and I'll show you some examples later. That assurance and verification piece is really important. And because we're members of the Royal College and have that professional standing, that's a really key part of certification for that animal or that consumer. Audit. Is in proper, so member states, people we're trading with will come and audit our systems because again it's not good enough just to say this is our system and they will audit from farm to fork, understanding how we put ID, ID tags in cattle right through to health marketing and abattoirs. And overarching for me all of that or underpinning all of that is the relationships you build with trading partners, with their scientists, with their vets, um, but you have that trust and transparency in relationship so when something goes not quite right, a consignment is stopped going into a country, we can get on the phone to you and you can sort it out and it's not withdrawn. So we do a lot of international surveillance. We do a lot of thinking about what diseases are out there in the world and what's going on. We do this at, um, so DEFRA looks internationally every day in our international disease monitoring team. And we share that information with the EU, which is what this slide shows. We do an international hazard forward look. Looking for changing risks around the world, because if you're trading with that country and there's a changed risk, you might import disease from them, you get disease, therefore you no longer trade. And of course it's extra complicated because we call vector-borne diseases, fomite-borne diseases and so on um, that happen. We currently have disease freedom status um, both for the UK and our Crown Dependencies and overseas territories because they all come under the UK banner in terms of OIE. 
and for all these um, significant distances. <coughs> so we have um, declared country freedom um, as in provision. The OIE doesn't require you to submit evidence at the moment for absolutely all notifiable exotic diseases. Um, it requests their working through a and organisation. So these are the ones that we have submitted to dossiers and have recognised freedom for. Um, we have the zonal risk status for BSC. So what that means is that... Um, oops, where's it gone? Right. So um, Northern Ireland has negligible risk status for BSC. They've not had uh, detection of BSC for um, some <coughs> time. And then we in the RECT3 have controlled risk status for BSC. And then we have diseases that we have self-declared freedom for. Um, that is potentially still open to challenge, so even influenza, for example, China won't accept poultry for us at the moment, despite our last even influenza outbreak being in 2017, um, because they feel they still have some unanswered questions around that. So the OIE, as I said, is the hub for the standards and the holder and keeper of the international information. <coughs> Depends everybody treated. So, uh, African swine fever, I mention it a lot because it's the biggest worry that keeps me awake at night on the disease front. And we are at medium risk for incursion of this disease. And this is for two reasons. Um, one, because, oops, this map actually chopped off um, Belgium. There was a detection in Belgium in wild boar last summer. It had done a massive jump from. Um, Eastern Europe here, where it's mostly in wild boar, that's the purple spots, but also in commercial farms in Romania. And um, there's no disease in the west of Poland, none in Germany and so on. It did this massive jump over to Belgium and was detected in wild boar. And, and we don't know why, and we probably will never be able to pin down why, because the um, genetics of the virus don't change hugely much in each movement from animal to animal. So to trace back to was the infection that um, it previously came from in Eastern Europe, was it in Romania and so on, um, is not going to be possible. But there is a main artery road that runs across North Germany and into Belgium, um, an international <coughs> route that lots of trucks go through and is a big truck stop. There's an army base and so on. So it popped up in Belgium and it really worried Western Europe. So at the same time, China declared they had, they had disease and it has subsequently spread down into Vietnam and into Myanmar and so on. And China has half the world's pigs. Um, about 68% of their protein intake in China is made up of pork. So this is like, absolutely massive for them. And they are concerned, literally, how are they going to feed people? Um, they've done a huge amount of work um, but when you have it spread over such an enormous area, it's really, um, and it's in your well bore population, it's difficult to control. Um, and so, oops, that was what I meant to do. Um, between China and the Belgium outbreak, we increased our risk of incursion for medium. Um, however, as we'll see, the level of controls mean that our level of risk of coming onto farm is much less than that. It's, um, low risk, which is much less likely than um, medium risk of incursion because we have controls between coming into the country and getting on to farm. Um, it has, however, and um, we'll see on a subsequent slide, um, this need to feed people in China is changing the um, world's pork consumption and prices. Um, and so it's an example of how a disease um, outbreak can have such a massive global <laughs> so we think about controls, so this is going back to um, or what's our assurance and verification, what's our animal health status and it's not good enough just to say oh it's such and such you have to be able to evidence it and part of evidencing it is being able to prove that you have the right controls in place to stop yourself getting disease. So we have pre-border controls. That's about reducing factors in other countries that might mean disease spreads to you. And an example of that would be the EU FND project. So the EU funds and the UK as additional funding, we're one of the top four contributors, to the EU FND programme 
which funds training activities and disease control activities in infected, um, foot and mouth disease infected countries. So in Kenya, for example, in Turkey and so on, they've done a lot of work. It is an opportunity for training our staff that are able to go out there, and also it's about upskilling and supporting people in those countries so that their disease levels reduce, it reduces the global burden of FMD, and therefore our risks in the UK are subsequently reduced. Um, and then there's the horizon scanning that I've talked about, understanding the changing risks every day. Do you have um, movements or uh, um, risk pathways between those countries, and what do you need to control? And then we have at-border activities. So that's when products from third countries come in, they come with their certificate, they get stopped at the border, at border inspection post, and we check their identity, we check they are what we say they are, and then we do a number of physical checks. Is that animal healthy? Is that milk powder in that tin really milk powder, or is it something else? And I was at Heathrow last Thursday morning, um, they were checking luggage coming off flights from um, Asia in relation to African swine fever and did um, pull out some um, meat preparations that people had brought with them. Uh, unknowingly, um, the late they got stopped, we pulled those out and interesting enough, in doing that they also found lots of other things. Um, the dogs are trained not just to look for meat, they can look for cigarettes and drugs and all sorts of other things in one dog and so they found a whole gamut of different things. So at the border activities both making sure that what you know about is compliant and detecting the things that you don't know about that shouldn't be coming and um, pick it outbreak and then we have a trigger. So therefore the in-country activities of disease control are really really important. Um, if you stop disease from being in that bin to getting in that pig um, then you stop all those massive impacts. So I'm actually going to talk about all these biosecurity controls and um, double fencing, um, knowing who comes onto your farm, making sure they have appropriate clean clothing, all these different things which seem so terribly burdensome actually help support um, reducing the disease risk um, to your to in individual farms. But it's not just about what's going on internationally in terms of disease risk. Um, we think a lot about the UK surveillance system. Um, so um, BSE, new and emerging disease in the UK, um, detected from having an increasing number of um, cattle and downy cows, if you like, unable to get up and so on. Investigations um, proved that they had this similar new um, pathological condition to scrapie and the BSE was confirmed. So a network of vets out there who are seeing animals every day is really important information source and um, feeding in new, new things at the seeing or if not new things what you are seeing so that we can amass it into an intelligence picture of what might be going on. Another example is um, a few years, not that long ago, we had hypervitaminosis A in lambs. So people were seeing lambs with um, signs of too much vitamin A, really randomly. We put the picture together, did some investigations, and it turned out it was a certain batch or um, make of um, replacement milk powder that had too high vitamin A levels, and, and that's what we're seeing. So we were able to inform people, this is what the cause of it is, so feeding that powder. Um, Schmallenberg is a really interesting virus, so it emerged um, for the first time anywhere globally in Europe in 2011. It was first detected in um, the north of Germany and the Netherlands, and what they saw was a reducing milk yield at a regional level in their dairy. <coughs> so at individual farm level it didn't mean much, um, but when they amassed that information at regional level, I mean, it's a bit odd to have all these farms in this region with reduced milk yield, what's going on? And they tested for blue tongue, and it was a blue tongue, and they tested for a whole myriad, myriad of other things and couldn't get a diagnosis. And it was only when they looked at the genetics of the virus that they found that this was a completely new virus related to one seen in um, Australia and Asia, but never, um, but not the same, and never before seen um, in Europe. 
And subsequent to seeing these reduced milk peels, a few months later, they realised that those same farms were having malformed calves and lambs born, and that was as a result of the same Schmelenberg infection. Um, and this all happened over a period of probably about five months, and um, this emerging understanding of this new virus. So the first question we're asking ourselves is, is this a zoonotic disease? Um, you know, potentially, if um, Zika virus, for example, not the same, but you know, immune emerging vector-borne disease that can um, infect animals if it has the same impact on people, that is going to be really, really significant. But from the, our health colleagues looking through all their data from the same periods, they were able to confirm, you know, we're not seeing any, anything new in um, new babies born and so on, there's nothing going on there, so this was an animal only disease. And then you have to work out what are you going to do? you need to do anything about it? And if so what? And then in whose gift is that? And you think about that in terms of the impact. So I said earlier that government takes action on animal disease where there's a trade impacts, economic, welfare, public health. So we rule out public health. Now we realised that actually <coughs> a lot of animals were infected, but you didn't see many clinical signs. It was only a few that were affected. <coughs> the dam had been at a certain stage of pregnancy at the time of infection. So the actual um, economic impact and the potential trade impact was really small. And we opted um, not for government intervention, but we supported the vaccine manufacturers to develop vaccines so that those people who want to vaccinate their animals next season round, um, and it wasn't made to viable. But that's a sort of an example of complex problem solving. That I really enjoy. We worked with um, private vets out there and um, we did to take samples to understand where the disease was in the UK and then could feed that information back to vets in practice, to farmers to say, um, your area we're not seeing any disease at all, your area we are, you might want to think about vaccination. It was about giving that intelligence back so that people could use it to manage um, their animal management activities and things. So our UK surveillance system um, relies heavily on private vets sending in samples. Um, we send them into the veterinary investigation centres, they undertake the post-mortems and the testing. Um, they get the diagnosis back, most of it's about endemic disease. But we look across that for these changing trends. Are we seeing changing trends in diagnosis of endemic disease? Are we seeing um, changing trends in that are inability to diagnose disease, so you've got something new and emerging and the tests aren't working. Yeah. And that builds up that system, so it delivers information back to farmers and vets, but it also builds up this picture about what the UK animal health and welfare status is. And you can go online and you can look up in the APHA um, disease um, reports, anybody in the world can go in and look at cattle diagnosis in England, for example. Um, and you can home into a county and so on, and you can look at the endemic diseases that are being um, detected in the system. That is a really good example of us being open in communication, trust and transparency. It shows A, we know what's going on, and B, we're prepared to share with people. Um, and it wouldn't work without everybody in the system, from farmers, through to our science experts, putting it online, and then I can talk about it um, when I go internationally. Um, and it absolutely underpins that trust and transparency. We also do a lot, um, we'll see, in wildlife surveillance, because so many new and emerging zoonotic diseases, diseases that impact humans, actually emerge in So we have a team that looks every month um, at new and emerging disease threats. Um, this system came about following the reviews um, from Mouth Disease 2001-2007, um, where they said you need to have a systematic, consistent and regular assessment of emerging disease risks. Because if you just do it ad hoc, then it becomes meaningless because you don't have a context in which to do it. You need to do it in the same way every time, and you need to be consistent in how you do it. And so across um, from our vets in the field, scientists, FSA, veterinary medicines directorate, 
vets and technicians all across the system every month input to us and to put to central team the veterinary school if they're seeing any new and emerging threats anything different and it's not just about diseases it might be a change in practice on the farm that somebody's doing um, so well bse was an example of that when they changed um, how they treated waste material that was fed back to animals anything that might change a risk pathway can be notified into the system and then we score that threat based on its potential impact and those four areas remember trade impact welfare impact public health impact economic impact see the size of the risk we think about what controls we might um, take in it and whether it's something that we as government need to be thinking about if it isn't we feed that information back out it's published in the vet record you may see it periodically um, and also we escalate the top level ones to ministers so we come through the vet nurse group we come on a monthly basis to the four chief vets meeting who oversight them and then i take them monthly to a monthly biosecurity group um, which where whoops ministers but we don't just discuss the ministers the animal ones we um look at across the spectrum of plants invasive species aquatic animals and bees and animal disease because what you get from ministers is when they read the daily mail or something in the morning and it's got a headline about a new emerging disease for example a um, potentially gastroenteritis or something in norway that's um, killing dogs at the moment and they go we need to do something about this but we've only got limited resource so how do you work out where, where are you going to focus and target your resource and we find this structure really helpful. So what this does is, along the bottom, it plots the likelihood of an outbreak, a reasonable worst case scenario outbreak in the next few years. And up the side, in log scale, it has the impact of that outbreak. And to be able to plot animals, plants, aquatics all together, you have to monetize the impact of the outbreaks. Um, otherwise, you're comparing apples and pears. Oh, we have some standing ones on it. And so you'll see foot and mouth disease there, blue tongue. We have them there every month because they're the ones that stick in ministers' mind and they understand. We have them there every month. And then we put the new ones in the red circle. So that month it was equine viral arteritis. We've had an equine viral arteritis outbreak um, since the spring in the UK. We managed that at premise and um, stable level. Um, and it, and it showed to ministers in doing it this way why we're still actually focusing a lot on African swine fever and yes we're doing things with the EVA but it, um, they're proportionate to what the impact is of the outbreak. <coughs> Obviously there's a huge amount of um, we have huge confidence intervals for these because often you know every outbreak even if the same disease is different and therefore the impact's different because it depends how it um, response in your population of animals that you're looking at but this is a really effective way of communicating versus I, and i said that earlier communication was one of my biggest learning from foot and mouth disease um, and this is an example of how you can talk to non-technical people about what disease risks are and where you need to prioritize resource again a bit like you might do in a consulting you know vaccinating should you vaccinate your dog or not But we need to be mindful too, not just of the disease risks we face now, but we do a lot of thinking about changing disease risks. So um, climate, climate change has the potential to change disease risks as um, vector patterns change, then they have the potential to spread diseases and also changing trade routes. So I mentioned about African swine fever is changing how pork is traded globally. Um, and this top picture up here um, is exports of pork, global exports, big green circles in Europe. Um, and Germany there is the biggest exporter of pork followed by Spain. Actually, UK does um, reasonably well there. Um, and what we're exporting primarily today has been what we call the fifth quarter. So that's the bit of the pig that our consumers don't want to eat. It's the trotters and the head and so on. Um, 
in the, in the UK and these abattoirs and processors who bin those parts because they have no value, right? being able to export them to countries where culturally they are of significance um, and they are part of their diet, there's added value for them. And then the bottom is global pork imports and the big um, orange apricot coloured um, blobs are Asia, so um, exports from the EU into Asia um, and that is, this is from about this time last year, that has changed significantly already um, as China and Asia seek to increase their imports to feed um, their population. Um, but it's an example of um, because of pig prices have increased um, globally, because of that demand, it's changed how um, things are traded within Europe, for example. So how do we know about the changes? We continue to do our horizon scanning. We do a lot of meteorological modelling with the Met Office. So if you think of the vector-borne diseases, say blue tongue coming over from the continent, um, we look at weather patterns and say, OK, this is likely to happen. This is when potentially it will happen. We're able to put farmers and vets in alert to be able to look out for it. Um, and hopefully we'll spot it quicker or put more quicker than we might um, do otherwise. So for example, with Blue Tongue in 2007, they said, we think you're most likely to get it in um, August, September time. And when they look back retrospectively, 4th of August was the first introduction, and um, it took some weeks before the, um, that was the introduction, and then you have to have um, the animal bite the midge. Biting an animal in the UK, it becomes infected, it's bitten by, um, UK midges and they become infected and disease starts to spread, so we first picked it up in September. That's a really important, uh, important part of understanding changing risks, and therefore we're talking about solving complex problems, what controls are you going to put in place? Testing, te oops. Um, testing technology and advancing testing. So the quicker you detect disease, the sooner you can take action about it. Look, okay, imagine if you had pen side tests for African swine fever, um, you would so much quicker be able to, um, in, in Asian countries as well, we would so much quicker be able to detect where it is and take action. Um, it also supports freedom or movement of things that you're able to say this is free from certain diseases. Artificial intelligence. So more and more um, that horizon scanning, looking at hard and soft information globally, um, about what is changing out there, picking out things from news headlines and so on, piecing them together. Artificial intelligence, like how banks use, um, for example, for fraud, we're now able to use it in the animal health space. Social media plays a big part in that too. So, obviously, it supports the um, spread of uninformed information, but from that, it can give you an early warning alert that you can then go and dig down and try and find the um, real evidence of information. I say um, we in the UK publish a lot of what we're doing in that space um, on, um, on the gov.uk website so anybody can access it because it underpins that trust and transparency that we want to have about our animal health status um, that supports trade. The EU. So we talked a lot about trade and insurance and verification. Um, Trade is obviously very important for the EU and we have, um, as a member state, benefited from free trade across all member states. And what that means is that by having the same legislation and the same controls, it means that some products can move freely um, right across all member states. So animals, because there's the potential for clinically well animals still to um, be transmitting disease, for that you get some reduction in checks. But you don't get the same reduction in checks as you do as a member state because you're not fully the same legislation or fully the same controls. But you get some reduction as Switzerland is a model of that. And then you can become you can be a third country. So as a third country, you can have different legislation to the EU. You could be Australia or America or Russia or whoever, and you have different controls. But the EU still needs to be guaranteed that what you're sending it is safe and not going to introduce disease. So therefore, you have export health certificates, 
and you have checks at the point of entry for the inspection forms. You can have equivalence agreements, veterinary agreements, so New Zealand has one with the EU, um, where they've inspected each other's systems and they say, yep, they're pretty much the same, we're working to the same standards and the same outcomes and things. So because of that, you can have some reduced levels of checks. But there are still checks there. It's not the same as being in a customs union. The customs union bit is all about the um, tax and um, treasury processes that underpin trade and movement of goods. And you would say, say it's very far removed from the animal health and welfare. But the legislation in the EU actually joins up, um, for example, around registered horses. So registered horses, um, they have to, you, so you have, if you're moving a horse, it's a third country, <coughs> it has its identity it's a, um, on the export health certificate. Um, you can have some level of reduced checks in some circumstances because it's a high health status force. But the register, what's registered in the study book is recognised in a piece of legislation. But it's not animal health legislation. It is legislation that supports having less tax as a business than moving the horse. Because it's classed as a pedigree animal rather than just a trade. It's really complicated and I never thought I'd be speaking about stuff like this. But this is how the whole EU legislation piece is so complex and so difficult to unpick. We hear an awful lot about no deal. What no deal really means is that we leave the EU without a withdrawal agreement. So we leave without the withdrawal agreement means that for a period, until we get to a future permanent trading relationship with the EU, we would undertake to do things the same um, during the withdrawal while they agreed um, that future trade agreement. And so the animal health and welfare checks would stay the same, we would keep the same legislation, and for that we would benefit from not having any checks in place. And so what we're facing on the 31st of October is a withdrawal agreement. Um, previously there was one, didn't get past Parliament, it's been renegotiated, it will have to be signed off by the EU Council and then um, passed by the UK Parliament. So the withdrawal agreement is being discussed, but it's not yet in place. If it's not in place on the 31st of October, then we either have to have an extension granted by the EU Council, or we have no withdrawal agreement, no deal, and we automatically become a third country to the EU. To be a third country, you don't automatically get to trade, because what about all these goods? They might be risky goods that you're going to move. So you have to have a process in place um, for the EU to have reassurance, I should say as a trade partner, it's not about just to call you, to have reassurance that what you're sending them is subject to certain checks and processes and things, and so we have to be listed. We have to have submitted our national monitoring plan for residues and things. We have to um, confirm that we will have the right legislation that will give us the right controls in place to help protect our trade, um, and assure them that we're not sending them any risky material. Now on Friday I will go back to Brussels and there will be a meeting with all the 28 member states when they get to vote on whether they think we have met those requirements or not. If the vote's passed, we can be a third country. If there's no withdrawal agreement, we trade with them under as a third country. If it's not passed, then we can't trade as a third country. So what does it mean for this? So at the moment, as I said, all foods that contains um, or products of animal origin uh, moves without a certificate, it moves straight from the factory because the factory applies certain processes. As a third country to the EU, you have to certify all those food products. And as you might remember from particularly the um, horse meat scandal or if you um, visited any of these factories, um, there's a huge amount, as things are manufactured, of movement within the um, EU of different food commodities. So you start with the carcass, and it might go somewhere to be chopped up, and then it might go somewhere else to be processed, and it might go somewhere else to be made into the chicken pie, and it might go somewhere else to be chopped up, and so on. There is a huge amount of movement. Every time 
that product or that potential product moves across the border into the EU and out, it will have to be, into the EU from our perspective, it will have to be certified. And it's only for most things, not everything, and fish is an exception, it has to be a veterinary surgeon that signs that certificate. We're going to have to do more certificates and so we're going to need more vets to be signing the certificates. <coughs> Pet travel requirements. So I talked about being listed as a third country, and that's about trade, but we don't trade pets. Pets are people's companion animals um, or assistance animals, and they move with the persons they go. So because they're not trade, we don't become listed with them, and that sits with Task Force 50. It's not a trade technical thing. Pets can move without us being listed, but it's more onerous, and hopefully that message has gone out because we've been communicating it a lot since last November. And um, if on the, when we exit the EU, we don't have a withdrawal agreement, um, pets will have to have gone through a much more onerous process to be able to move. So that's vaccination with your ID chip, um, blood test after a month, wait a few months, you get your test certificate and then you can move, whereas at the moment it's a much easier process. And that's something we're really keen, obviously. We want people to be able to move and go about the business as easily as possible. It's something we've been communicating a lot. So if you're going into smile on practice, or seeing smile on practice, it's a question that's likely to come up a lot. If you're moving horses, again, there are different categories for horses depending on the disease status of the country they originate. When we got, when we were listed in April, the top disease status Part A, but it still involves um, testing for certain diseases, it still involves export health certificates. At the moment we benefit from a thing called the tripartite agreement where high health status forces can move pretty freely between France, the UK and Ireland. And that's all potentially your thoroughbreds racing competition horses. They're high health status, they're oversighted by weather based and so on and they move easily. That won't be possible if no deal exit. So people moving horses will have to plan in more time, not just for any testing, but also for the checks. And you will have to go enter the country you're going into, member state, through a border inspection post. So you can't just go on ferry to the Netherlands. There will be no border port, border inspection post. You'll have to go via France and then that. Um, as it says, there are specific testing, residency, and isolation requirements for horses. <coughs> it also means that we're not automatically, as vets, able to go work on the continent, right? At the moment, there's a thing called the Mutual Recognition of Qualifications <coughs> legislation. So, if you're a vet or a doctor in one member state, you're able to go work in another member state. It's just accepted. That won't be in place if we become third country. It will be up to individual countries to decide if they recognise our standards from the Royal College that they can go and practice or not. And likewise, it will be up to our Royal College to decide if vets from other countries um, meet the right standards to be able to come and register as members. Here, they are looking at the E standards, um, which is a pan Europe um, assessment process and how that could. Obviously, vets are really important to us and we want them to be able to come and work. Um, so that's the um, kind of up to the 31st of October status. And um, thinking further than that, what's the future for us? So um, regardless of what our future relationship with Europe is, we recognise that we need to do more to improve productivity and um, more to um, support our um, USP of being one of the world leaders in animal health and welfare. Um, we need to support that with underpinning technologies um, and we need to think more, not because of EU exit, but animal health and welfare because of society's interest in this area. So some things that are uh, that thinking that's going on just now that will impact on you, um, particularly if you go into farm animal practice in the future. So, we have been growing our export market and we continue to grow it. Um, we were given access for beef and lamb by Japan in January. We've agreed a beef protocol with China. Um, we now can get pork into Taiwan. Um, so a lot of work has been going on in this space and continues to do. 
it, it's important because I come back again. It's important to rural health and rural economies. And um, if you want to be a large animal vet, there's no viable farms and there's no future for you in that career. But it also links then into the offspin industries where many vets are involved. Endemic disease um, not only um, says something about our animal health and welfare status um, and our productivity, but it also, as we know, has quite a lot to do with how we use resources efficiently. So not just from the fact that we want to improve productivity, and it's not about productivity at any cost and making everything intensive, it's about how do we get most outputs for the inputs we're giving. We need to think more about doing what we do about facilitating and helping industry to reduce endemic disease levels. It also, of course, has a massive positive impact <coughs> on antimicrobial resistance. We have a really good news story to tell on antimicrobial resistance in this country, that we reduced our antibiotic sales in livestock from 40% in 2013 to 2017, which is a fantastic good news story, but there's more still to do. And a lot of that is about infection prevention and control, and it's about tackling endemic disease. And it's not a space that government's traditionally been in for a long time. When I talked about the government being in the space of diseases that have big impacts around the economy, public health, trade, endemic diseases don't fit in that space. But we recognise that there is public good, as we call it, from tackling these because it will reduce antibiotic usage, because it will um, reduce livestock use of resources. And so we are thinking, um, as Government has committed to giving some funding support to farmers after CAP, CAP's the Common Agricultural Policy, where there is support to farmers across Europe to encourage them to do certain activities. Now, traditionally, it came and started after the Second World War, and it was about increasing productivity of farm. and farms. It has changed over time to become more environmentally focused and so on. Um, Government has committed for a period to continue that funding, but other, rather than having to follow EU regulations if we're not no longer a member state, we will be able to shape how we use that funding in the UK context. So thinking about the UK animal populations, how UK farms work and things. Um, and we, it's not about government telling vets and farmers how to control disease, it's about facilitating industry to come together to be able to think about what are their endemic disease priorities and how do they motivate farmers to undertake them. But as we know, in our disease um, control schemes, particularly if you want to eradicate BVD, for example, you need 100% of people to be taking part in it. It's not good enough just to have the top people. And the fire brigade approach, um, traditional to veterinary medicine, we want to do more, as I say, in that endemic disease space, more proactive planning, infection prevention and control. Traceability for me, so that's the identification of livestock animals and how they move, is one of the fundamental things that underpins disease, effective disease control. The other being epidemiology. You need to know how animals move and you need to know why is disease on this farm, how did it get here and where is it going to. But traceability to farms particularly seems like a really huge burden. And at the moment it is to agree. Um, because we have a different system for cattle and a different system for sheep and a different system for pigs. And some of them are electronic and some of them aren't and it's really confusing. And so we want to progress to a multi-species system um, with blockchain technology where you can build up a whole picture of that animal, that farm or that consignment. And it stops being just about information government needs about animals, but information that everybody in the industry can need so that that cow that I might be interested in investigating for a certain reason is the same cow on the same farm collecting carcass data, genetic data, endemic disease data, so that it builds towards again, you know, trade and transparency, not just that you know what diseases are there, but if you're selling to um, to Japan, for example, you can know the spec um, about the carcass, the genetics it had, um, and you can start to do genetics now, and meat tenderness and tastiness and so on. It's very important to the Japanese um, about for animal welfare um, and the provenance of where their meat comes from. You can start to build all that information in. And so how we use that, building up the intelligence picture, and feeding that back, um, both 
within the UK, back to farm a little bit and internationally, I think will be a big part of um, how we develop our farming systems going forward. And it's a huge um, agri-technology space, so um, thinking about electronic transponders and what information you can pick up. Um, I was at Harper Adams recently and they have um, cows with rumen transponders that monitor rumen movements and things. So you know if that cow is going acidotic, <coughs> then before she starts to go for feeding, you can start doing things about it. It's giving information back to people who can then make decisions based on that. It doesn't do away with your clinical examination and things, but it starts to give you those early heads up so you can take action quickly. A um, huge amount has gone on at SEC for quite a while now, but a lot thinking back to genetics and um, body scoring, muscling, um, and so on. You can imagine where in our um, multi species database you start putting or linking all this information together. And it's not that everybody would have access to it, uh, but people could have access to certain pictures that add value to what their business is. And animal welfare. So UK um, society, we know well that we're very caring about animal welfare, but this is starting to expand globally. We see it more and more. I was speaking to somebody the other day um, from the Soil Association, going out to Korea to talk to them about how we do organics and animal welfare. Um, as, um, particularly Asian or highly populated countries become more affluent, affluent and they eat more protein, they're more interested in animal welfare and the provenance of their food. And I think the animal welfare debate will only grow and grow and there will be increased public perception about it. Um, so I'm very keen that we talk about um, and we support our animal health and welfare standards. And we support people having the right choices in that space and the information consumers to make the right choices. So looking again at um, future funding support to farmers using public money for higher welfare outcomes because we know that the public cares about that, how we give them the right information and labeling and consumer awareness, and then how that supports international engagement and trade. I've touched already on the farm to fork thing, but I can't really emphasize strongly enough about how important that is. I haven't appreciated as a vet in practice how I played my part in detect, making sure that cow clinical BSE didn't, you know, from my diagnosis, didn't get into the food chain. Didn't really appreciate when I did some slaughterhouse work how that regular oversight and relationship with the abattoir owners is so important in making sure that what goes out the door is safe to eat. Um, and then thinking of some of the roles I've had within government about surveillance to an emerging disease the important role that we play in that, and then as UK CDO. I'm still one with the team, I'm the one that goes out and talks more about it internationally, but as do many other people, many other vets, both from building science um, in other countries, um, building trade relationships and so on. We are all part of that assurance and verification team, ensuring to our consumers in the UK that what we eat is safe, and ensuring to those globally that what we eat is safe, supporting um, viable businesses and rural health. All along that system, we have a role to play. Um, and it's not um, the fact that well, even if government is really interesting, you go from really specific technical details. So I was doing an African swine fever exercise this afternoon, looking at if we got disease in, say, Suffolk in this scenario, what are the first decisions I might make in the first 24 hours? Um, to a meeting with ministers to talk about export health certificates and actually how they, their role in this um, assurance and verification chain. Um, and so, right from all the way through that process are not just our veterinary knowledge, but the skills about communication, problem solving, influence so on how we talk about a technically difficult subject to a wider audience. All these things are really, really important. So um, I hope that's given A an insight into the sort of things you can do in government. The role of CBO um, and even if you're out on the farm looking at people's pets, 
some thoughts on how, what you're doing every day is important, not just that, but also why this is happening. 